So the first thing you're probably wondering is, what the heck is a shaman? It's Spirit Rune, it's part of the new Ragnarok expansion. I don't think it's going to be a very popular class combo, but I played it, I actually really enjoyed it, and I'm going to make a build guide for it. So the concept here was shown off in a video I did earlier on my channel. Uh, it's exploring the life leech mechanic, which has always existed, and I'm talking about flat life leech, not attack damage converted to health. And it's just pushing that as far as we possibly can with the new Thunder Strike ability. That's about it. That's the concept. But I know there's people who just want to see the build and how it progresses through the levels instead of going through the whole spiel. So as always, I'm going to provide charts on screen of what I recommend you do incrementally as you level up. I'll show the stats and the masteries. So those of you who want to just see what it's about, you can get in and get out. For everyone else, you'll get the longer explanation. So the charts are on screen now, and again the concept here is Life Leech. It's also very cool thematically, if since it's Spirit of course it gets uh, Death Chill Aura, which looks just great, you know. And it's this Life Leeching thing, so very thematic sort of build. Uh, but the question I had, uh, and that I posed at the beginning, is could this really hold up into the endgame, this whole Life Leech thing? And I'm going to say yes, of course, and I will go into it. Uh, first, I want to say this character did make it through Deathless on Legendary, which was a great joy for me. It wasn't X Max or anything like that, just the standard game. I did it on stream. And the TLDR for the build is, is simply that you want to get... It's, an, it's a hybrid build. You're going to want to get Intellect for your gear. You're going to want to get Life Leech, Flat Life Leech, on your weapons as much as you can get. And you're going to want to use Thunder Strike and Seal Fate. That's about it. I will say before you guys go who just wanted to see the masteries and attributes that the attributes are going to be the most difficult part of this class. This is not a beginner friendly class. Uh, I did it on Deathless, but I struggled and I've played this game quite a bit. I've struggled with the attributes. The attributes are very tight in this build, much more than usual. Uh, and so you're going to have a pretty hard time incrementally getting what you need before you get to max level. So just keep that in mind, and we'll explore that more later on in the topics. First, though, some strengths and weaknesses of the build. Uh, I'll start with actually the weaknesses, because again, I think this is a strong build, but it's not a beginner-friendly build. Uh, so hopefully I could show off why. First, you have the two lowest HP progression masteries in the game combined with each other. Spirit and, and Rune, those are both like 640, I think is what you get at 32. That's very bad. If you contrast that with Defense, which gets 2,000, Earth and Warfare, which get 1,100 or something like that, you're missing a lot of health, a huge chunk of health. What this means is you're going to have to make up for that lack of health somewhere. That's going to be in gear. That's going to be with your attributes. Uh, and also, you're not helped with your masteries by getting DA. You don't get defensive ability very much at all. You get very little dexterity in your masteries as well. And you might think this is very good because it's an intellect character, we want lots of intellect. Well, every character needs health and every character needs dexterity. So you're going to have to make up for that quite a lot. A strength to go alongside that is that Life Leech is actually good. This was very conceptual when I tried it out in my video earlier. Uh, and I'm happy to report that Flat Life Leech, at least with this very specific mastery setup, can be extremely, extremely effective. In my opinion, better than I've ever seen attack damage converted health perform. And if you watch my defense video, you probably heard me say that attack damage converted to health is the better form of leech. I stand by that. Uh, this is a very niche example of me pushing a mechanic that isn't very good to its ultimate extreme. And it just so happens that in this case, and this is an outlier, that flat life leech is better than any attack damage converted to health, but for most characters, you're still after attack damage converted to health. Another weakness, then, is that this requires farming, quite a bit of farming to get this guy going. What exactly do you need to farm? Well, we'll elaborate on that in a bit, but I will say that you need demon's blood. Not demon's blood. Everyone needs demon's blood. You need fury's heart blood, which drops from those furies, uh... You can farm them in, the, in two places. I would recommend, is it called Elysium? The place before Hades Palace. I think it's Elysium. Uh, or you could farm it in just past the Ghost's Village in Act 4. I don't remember what it's called. 
But anyway, it's not just enough to get a completed Fury's Heartblood. You need the right completion bonus. That completion bonus is going to be the Life Leech, of course. That's the whole concept of this build, is to have lots of flat Life Leech, especially on your weapon. And it takes a while to get that. In my own farming, it took me about 10 full completed Fury's Heartblood charms before I found one with the Life Leech completion bonus. And you might need two of them, depending on your progression, maybe two of the epic version and one of the legendary version, um, because you'll be dual wielding an epic difficulty, but maybe not in legendary difficulty. So that's quite a bit of farming, plus you have to overcome the weaknesses of your character defensively with health, with DA, with resists. That's all pretty hard to do, and you overcome those weaknesses if they're not in your mastery through gear. So you're going to have to farm, you know, really good completion bonuses on your relics and charms in general, and you're going to have to have decent gear capable of giving you those baseline defenses. Strength number two, then. You can double dip into your resists. Now, a lot of classes can do this. They can stack the different forms of resist reduction in the game. Uh, but luckily, as Spirit Master, you get definitely the best and most overpowered resist reduction in the game, which is Necrosis. Nothing even comes remotely close to Necrosis, trust me. Uh, it's always active. You, they just have to be in proximity, which is no big deal. You'll be using throwing weapons. And it does an extreme amount of resist reduction. It's over 100. I think the maximum is 10 or 118%. That's just insane, 118%. And this is the best form, if you look at the verbiage, is the best form of resist reduction. And you can stack this with Seal of Fate. Now, with the Dragon Hunter build, if you wanted to get the double resist reduction, you had to Seal Fate and you had to cast Flush Out, Study Prey. And that was extremely hard to pull off. Well, if one of your resist reductions is passive, then all you have to do is pull off the Seal of Fate, which is one of our main attacks anyway and you're always going to get the, the reduction to resists there, and it's going to be a huge monumental resist reduction, which happens to be very good for life leech, because it sets you up nicely to leech more life and do more damage, of course. Weakness number three, the, the damage remains average. Even if you get everything that this build needs uh, to perform, it's only going to perform adequately in the damage department. For me, that was just more than enough. It was well enough. I got through with no problems on my damage whatsoever. There's a little part, I think, in epic difficulty where I felt a little bit weak, but after I overcame that, it was no problem. Legendary is the big trial for damage. I had zero issues with legendary whatsoever. Uh, so I'll tell you that the damage is fine for me, but I build very well-rounded characters. When I look at other people play, it's painfully obvious to me that I don't build what other people build, and so that might be a perception thing, right? You might play this character and say, well, its damage isn't very good. I think it's amazing, but compared to the glass cannons you'll see in videos, this is not going to be up to par, and I don't think it can be made to get to that level. You're going to have things like Summon Outsider and Circle of Power to help with your damage, and you're going to have an amazing burst because of it, but it's never going to kill a boss in like two seconds flat. And we'll also end with a weakness then, so four weaknesses, two strengths. That sounds imbalanced, but the strengths are very good strengths. So the last weakness then is that the attributes are complex. I talked about this before. You're going to need dexterity. We don't just want dexterity for stonebinders cuffs. That's always what we say. Uh, but it's also because everyone needs some level of defensive ability just to survive. If you think you can get away without any DA and you don't want stonebinders, I recommend getting stone binders. by the way, they're extremely good, uh, then feel free to sacrifice on your dexterity a bit, but I will always recommend for every single character that they get enough dexterity for stone binders cuffs. So you're going to need that. You need enough intellect, intellect to wear your gear. It's intellect gear. We're not scaling strength. And you need a huge amount of health. I don't want to overstate it, but you need a lot of health to overcome the weaknesses of your masteries. Again, I don't build characters that end up with 4,000 health. I build characters that end up with 7,000 health. So it's very difficult to overcome the weaknesses provided by having 640 plus 640 life in your masteries. You're going to have to put a much higher average of attribute points into your health than probably any other character will need to do. So let's get into the build yet. We've yet to 
talk about how it actually works, how it all comes together. So first, is this a spellcaster or does it use weapon attacks? This is definitely a hybrid. So if you watch the pre warm up video to this character, the theory video, I would made a claim I was going to be a spellcaster. This was going to be my spellcasting character. I was sick of playing rune masters and I always ended up being some sort of hybrid or or weapon attacking character. Well, I fell into the trap again. It's just rune master is just a weapons or hybrid mastery period. Yes, you can probably do some corner case and say, "Ha, Clex, idiot." Well, for the most part, monumentally, like 95% of the time, anything coming out of the rune mastery will end up a hybrid or maybe a weapons character in general, just an auto attack character. So I didn't quite make it into spellcasting. This is definitely a hybrid. It uses its weapons to attack sometimes, definitely to apply that life leech to as much characters as you can. It uses its weapons in Thunderstrike. I would consider Thunderstrike a spell that happens to utilize your weapon. Uh, and it uses Seal of Fate. It uses a lot of Seal of Fate. So it uses about 80% spells, 20% attacks, I would say. That is, if you count Thunderstrike as a spell. Next, then, the gear type. I said before, you're going to want to scale Int just enough to wear your gear. Every character needs to choose at the beginning of the game whether they want to go Strength or whether they want to go Intelligence. Sorry, if you wanted to go Dexterity, there's no gear. Have a nice day. Well, there is, but you'd have to really twink for it. You'd have to get that gear specifically and put it all together and have something to equip at every level. But for most characters, it's intellect or strength. This character, definitely intellect. I said before we're going to be using Fury's Heartblood. Fury's Heartblood has a ton of flat vitality on it. And vitality damage scales very well with intellect. It scales better than elemental damage does. If you want the specifics on that, I've got an offense video. All of the links to the different sections of the topic are in the comments, so it should be pretty easy to find that. So to get the most out of our damage and to equip Freya's chest, frankly, because it's really, really good, we're going we're gonna to use intelligence rather than strength. Also, for our weapons, I chose throwing weapons. I have a high opinion of throwing weapons. They're easy to equip if you're already going for that Stonebinders benchmark for dexterity. It's likely you've met the benchmark for throwing weapons. That's especially true if you have Rune Word Feather, which gets rid of the strength requirement pretty much. So I ended up going with a throwing weapon plus shield in normal mode because I didn't have dual wielding unlocked. In epic mode, I was dual wielding throwing weapons, which is great for shotgunning, great for applying leech consistently. Uh, but in legendary mode, I had to switch back to a shield, and that's because I needed the pierce res. I had to overcome those weaknesses, right? So this build, I firmly believe, will end up being a weapon plus shield character. You can probably force it to become a dual wield character, but I think if you're going to make concessions to get higher damage, you should, you should make those concessions elsewhere. You shouldn't be aiming to replace your shield. You should be aiming to replace one of your rings from a resist ring to a life leech ring. That's my opinion, though. And of course, when we go over what gear my character has and what I recommend, you'll see some similarities between this character and my Dragon Hunter. I look for very specific things when I'm playing. I like to have high resists. So you'll see exactly what my line of thinking with my character is and where I'm trying to go with it and what I'm trying to buy my way into, in this case, a life leech ring. But for now, let's talk again about the attributes. I really want to hammer this home. This is the most, most complex part of the build. You're going to want decks for Stonebinders Cuffs. That's every single difficulty. You're going to want lots of HP more than normal. Your ending intelligence will be somewhere around 450 to 500. Why do I give it a range? Well, because 450 is really ideal, probably. And the reason for that is you're going to need minus requirements in your gear. Somewhere in your gear, there should be something that reduces requirements, ideally all requirements, not just strength or just dexterity or just intellect, but everything. I had about 15 in my gear, so minus 15% all requirements. You should really find a way to bake that into your gear, whether that's Toth's glory or an affix, in my case it rolled on a helm, uh, or whatever. You're going to need some small amount of reduced resistances just to, just to make it easier, just to make it a little bit easier to equip gear and to deal with your attribute mess, and this really is an attribute mess. 
So if you already have reduced requirements, then you can get away with having less intellect. You might be from the camp of people who think, well, if I'm going to, you know, have a lot of damage that's either vitality or elemental, which this character has, then I just want to scale intellect as much as I can. I want to get a thousand intellect. I want to get 1500 intellect. I don't think you can do that without calling this character a glass cannon. I don't think this character works well as a glass cannon. It's relying on life leech. If you die in three seconds, your life leech is not going to do anything at all. I can promise you that. So you need to be somewhat tanky. That way you can survive long enough to sustain. You don't want to see your health spiking up and down. Uh, so I really recommend that you don't go too crazy with the intellect, even though we are using rune weapon. Okay, so now to talk about how you progress your character incrementally through the game. Uh, and before we talk about how the character plays, we should go over one really important thing about this character, and that's that you can get life leech on your weapon and other pieces of gear throughout the game. This is not just a concept that can only be put into play in Legendary. You're going to start out right in Sparta, right when you can't afford it, you're going to be looking at a life leech weapon, and you're going to say, that's exactly what I want, right at the start of the game. So if we look, we can look at the prefixes, and these are all prefixes, by the way, the life leech things are prefixes. There is a suffix that adds scaling, but that doesn't matter. What we're looking for is the base life leech. So what, do I, what am I saying? You can see the Bloodthirsty right at level 8. That's 36 life leeched over 3 seconds. Rapacious. You're going to want to memorize these, probably. If you see them on the ground, you want to pick them up. If you see them in the vendor, you want to take notice of them. And you want to know when they're coming. Rapacious, level 25. Ravenous, level 15, 63 life leech over 3 seconds. Sanguine, starting right at level 3, you can get 15 life leech over 3 seconds on your weapon. And then, of course, Voracious. This is the absolute maximum roll. 147 isn't the highest you can go. Voracious has a range. All of them have a range. But this can go up to, I think, 168 is the highest I've seen it. That's a lot of life leech. So just keep these in mind. These are all yellow prefixes. What does that mean? Well, they're, they're prefixes that can roll on yellow weapons or items as well as green items. So these are not rare. You will find these on yellow weapons. You'll find them on green weapons. Ideally, your, your weapons will always be green because some of the green suffixes are very good. In particular, I think there's one that does a high chance to stun. Let me see if I can find that one. Is that it? Probably. No, I think it's more like these, of dazing. What's the exact one? This is the one, of nightmares. 60 vitality damage. Guess what? That goes really well through build. You're going to have necrosis. You're already going to have Fury's Heart Blood. This extra 60 vitality on top of the 100 flat vitality on Fury's Heart Blood, that's 160 flat vitality on your weapon. That's pretty good, in addition to all the base damage from the weapon that's being converted to elemental through uh, transmutation. You're going to be able to make a lot of use out of that through your intellect scaling. And see this 15% chance of 3 seconds of stun? That's not too shabby. Remember that these chances can apply every time your weapon attacks. So with uh, Thunder Strike, you're going to be throwing your weapon out five times. That's five individual chances to create this stun. That's pretty nice. So this is just something to keep in mind. We're going to go back into the game now to look at the progression, and it'll all become clear. So in the early game, we are a Rune Master. So every rune master in the early game, and I'm talking like level three, you know, we're going to pick up magical charge. This thing is an amazing leveling skill. It's not quite at the tier of ring of fire, but it's pretty close. Just put a bunch of points into it. Go nuts. Just get one or two into rune weapon just to allow you to keep the buff up. Magical charge only works if you have at least one stack of rune weapon. So I, I play with one. Two is a little bit better. But honestly, Magical Charge by itself can carry you through all the way through Act 1, Act 2, most of Act 3. It doesn't start falling off in power and effectiveness until maybe halfway through Act 3. And by then, you're going to have other tools. So we're going to have 1 point and Thunderstrike. Why 1 point? Why not 14 or 10? Well, that's because Thunderstrike works by throwing your weapon five times. So the power of Thunderstrike is very deterministic on the power of your weapon. And since we're a Life Leech character, we're not just interested in doing a lot of damage. 
We'll get to the damage in a bit, and remember, Magical Charge is still pretty good. We also want to spread Life Leech to as many characters as we can. So Life Leech doesn't stack on top of itself, but multiple Life Leeches on multiple targets will stack with each other. So if I throw this Thunder Strike and all five of those projectiles finds and hits their own targets, individual targets, I get to multiply the Life Leech on my weapons by five. I have five times that much Life Leech. That could be a ton of Life Leech added to your scaling through Necrosis and other things which we'll talk about. You're going to get a lot of Life Leeched, and you're going to get a lot of mileage out of using this Thunderstrike. This is one of those big things that was part of this build. This was the reason I created this build, is because of Thunderstrike. We've had things like, uh, what is it called? Not fan of knives, but throwing knives in Rogue. That has special rules, so each time a knife hits a target, you can apply the life leech on your rings and on your amulets uh, to those attacks, and each knife can hit its own target, and thus you're going to be leeching a bunch of life from all these different targets. Well, the drawback from throwing knives is that it could not apply leech from your weapon, and your weapon is going to be the greatest source of life leech in your arsenal. So that's where Thunderstrike comes in. Again, Thunderstrike just throws five of your weapon. So each, if each of them hits its own target, you're going to get the life leech from your weapon, from your rings, and from your amulet and your artifact if you have them. So the potential to leech life from enemies is much greater with this build than with a throwing knives build. It's just in order to get your consistency up, you're going to have to learn how to make use of these throwing knives to get the right angles to hit multiple targets. Do wielding helps, but if you get good enough with the character, you can make do with just five projectiles with a shield. Uh, of course, if you do wield, your throwing, I'm sorry, your thunder strike will throw ten weapons instead of five. So then you multiply your odds, right? It's very unlikely that you'll hit ten individual targets because of the spread. It just, uh, in my opinion, just increases the likelihood that you'll have leech up on as many targets as is conceivably possible. So back to the build then, we're still in the early game, we've got Magical Charge, we left one point into Thunderstrike, and that's what it'll be for most of the build. We want to save those points and put them elsewhere. You're going to get as much into Runeward Feather as you need to equip weapons. Uh, you're not going to, ideally, you're not going to put any points into Strength, and that's exactly what you want. And then you're going to go into Spirit. Once you have those tools, you might put one into Rune of Life. And this is your bread and butter. This is how the build operates. This is how the build lives, literally. If you lose this buff, you are dead. Game over. It's Death Chill Aura. If you've played with Spirit before, you probably have a very high opinion of Death Chill Aura. If you have a very low opinion of Death Chill Aura, let me try to change your mind. So the base effect, not very good. Minus total speed, that's all right. You know, I like that. That's good. The minus reduction to enemy health, eh, fine. It doesn't make or break a build, really. What you want in the base skill is just the radius. The 4.5 meter radius, that's the maximum radius. It's about equal to the range of throwing weapons. You can see it kind of ends right here at this arc. It's about the range of throwing weapons, maybe a little bit shorter. So you need this in order to uh, make enemies debuffed uh, to begin with. But this is where it gets really powerful. Ravages of Time, 45% reduced damage for one second. This is going to tick and reapply over and over again, right? That is a huge amount of reduced damage. Enemies are just going to do that much less damage to you, all of them that are near you. And, I mean, archers you can LOS, you can hide behind something, but melee are sometimes very hard to shake off. Uh, you think of, like, Melano or Lamia from Act 4 or the Dragonkin in Typhon's Cave, or anything pretty much in Act 5, they're going to hit very hard in melee. And this character doesn't have a lot of DA, so you really depend on Ravages of Time to survive. You don't care about the armor absorption, that's not important. We aren't a physical damage character. But the reduced damage is extremely good. I would say this is very, very overpowered, to be honest. And then we have Necrosis. I already talked about Necrosis. Excuse me. It wasn't 118%, it was 119%. It's even better than I thought. Wow. It's good. It's good. That was just a little bit of overstating, but 119% reduced resistances. You can take a creature who's supposed to be 100% resistant to vitality damage or life leech, and you can make them not resistant. In fact, you can make them susceptible 
to life leech and vitality damage. So this is an extremely good tool, and it's the reason why I don't think life leech works, flat life leech, on any other character except for this character, is because of necrosis and because of thunderstrike. I really don't think the pair would do too well on its own if it weren't for life leech. I'm sure there's people who can be crafty and clever and create something, but I also don't think that life leech itself would be as good without these specific two masteries. So just keep that in mind. Necrosis is the reason we're doing so well. So you want to get these as early as you possibly can. Max out Ravages of Time, max out Necrosis in the early game. I'm talking like before you get to epic difficulty. Once you have that stuff, I would definitely consider going towards Seal of Fate. Seal of Fate is extremely powerful in the early game. I think I ended up getting this by around the end of Act 3 on normal mode. I can't quite remember. I got it as early as I can. But you can see maxed out, the base damage of the skill is 1300 elemental. That's very good. That's a very, very high base. Yeah, it's kind of annoying to use, but you'll really learn how to use it. And I'll talk about how to use it a little bit better once we get to the gameplay section of this video. But you're going to want at least the base here. You don't need Aftershock right away. Again, you want to make good use of your skill points, you know, put one point here and there, put one point into Sacred Rage, one into Energy Drain, maybe max out Frightening Power before Epic Difficulty, something like that. Uh, by the way, Frightening Power, not good with just one point, very, very good with max. All right, that's because the, the fear has a percentage chance to go off, and you don't want that to be inconsistent. Frankly, you don't. So you're going to want to max this out if you're going to get it at all. I think I did that slightly before Epic Difficulty. So you're going to have to make concessions somewhere. Not maxing out Thunderstrike is a good concession. Not getting Lich King, by the way. He's not very good in this build. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But of course, ever, eventually you will want Aftershock. I ended up getting it, uh, I don't know, end of Epic Difficulty, something like that. Maybe halfway through Epic Difficulty. Just because you could stack the 77 reduced resistances with the 119 here in Necrosis. So overall, let's see if I could do math. That'd be 196 reduced life leech resistance and vitality resistance. That's pretty amazing. So you shouldn't take that for granted, and eventually you should go into here. You should put one point into Reckless Offense. This enables your dual wielding. I still have it enabled. I shouldn't. I should take this out because I'm no longer dual wielding. Uh, but you can see that it allows and requires dual wielding. So you can't just put points into here if you're not dual wielding. You can't take advantage of the total damage. So just to keep in mind, in epic difficulty, you'll probably dual wield throwing weapons. But then you'll have to switch back in legendary just to use shields and get pierce res. As always, I don't think energy armor has a place, maybe in very, very niche builds, but I just frankly don't agree with the developers on the power level of this ability. Uh, I just don't see how this could be good at its energy cost. There's just too much you would have to sacrifice to get the reduced energy cost and the reduced recharge to make this decent. Maybe a pet build, who knows. Anyway, as we're approaching the end game for this character, uh, what you get is mostly, I mean, everything's approachable by now. You've had full masteries and everything like that. So let's just talk about the rest of the stuff real quick, starting with the rune tree. Uh, I don't get rune word explosion. It's great on an attack based build. This is a hybrid build. Uh, we're going to convert our weapons, of course, because it's better as Ellie than it is as strength or physical. And that's a pretty mild thing to do. It only costs six points. No big deal. But 10 points for Rune Word Explode for a proc on weapon attacks just didn't seem worth it to me. There are other things that I wanted. Uh, you can feel free to test it yourself and see if you like it. I didn't think it really had a place. I didn't attack enough to make this useful. Of course, you don't get Rune Word Burn then. I could get a point into Rune Word Absor Absorb. Uh, this absorption of spell energy, by the way, the way it works is you'll take damage. 23% of the damage you take gets given to you in energy. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't absorb the damage of the spell. You don't take less damage. It just takes the damage you took and adds it to your energy. So it's not a very reliable form of energy recovery. I felt like energy drain was good enough. 
Uh, you could take this in the earlier game, though, uh, just because, like I said, if you get your Death Chill Aura stripped, you are dead. So anything to help keep your energy topped off is probably a good thing. I didn't end up needing it, and in the end game, I got this uh, Band of Souls, which gives you energy leech resistance. Got it maxed out, so I don't have to worry about getting my energy leech. Of course, energy leech resistance caps at 80%, like every other resist. But I've found that I haven't had my Death Chill Aura stripped from a energy leech at all since I got this item. Of course, it can still be purged by certain enemies, spell breakers and stuff like that, but it can't be stripped with energy drain. And Men Here Wall, of course, is amazing. I've grown very fond of this ability. I actually have a very high ab ab opinion of Men Here Wall now. But only if you can get your auto hotkey to work for you or you can set up a macro for your keyboard. We'll talk about that in a bit. I've talked about it before in other videos as well. But for me, for instance, hopefully I have my script running. If I want to cast this, all I do is I have to hit the button and it casts. Otherwise, you have to have a reticle. So if I put it right here, I don't have a hotkey assigned to 6. So if I were to press 6, then you'd see it puts this reticle on my cursor. You might be able to see it. It's kind of at the bottom of my character right now. So you have to hit 6, and then you have to click again. That's very awkward. Uh, but once I got the script for the auto hotkey to work, if I just hit 3 when it's assigned to 3, it'll go off, and that makes it a very reliable and great defensive tool. I wish they would change that, but that's besides the point of this video. Other things, then. Uh, I think that covers it, actually, for the Rune Master Tree. You're going to want to keep Rune of Life high. You're going to want to max it out before you get to... Let's just say Epic Typhon. Max it out before Epic Typhon. Or Epic, Epic Yao Guai, just to get the bleed resistance. He's the boar boss in Act 3. And Spirit Mastery then. Turn in. This is not a staff-based build. Death Ward, right? We should talk about this. Read the tooltip right now. I'll, I'll read it aloud since if, if you're listening. It's got a 260-second recharge. The recharge is fine, non-consequential. You shouldn't be triggering this too often. It activates when your health drops below 15%. That is an extremely low threshold. And if you're wondering, no, it will not activate at 0%. So if something takes you from 20 to 0, you die. Death Ward does not trigger. Damage has to take you to or below 15% for this to trigger. So that's a little bit sensitive. Uh, turns out if you're at 15% life, you're pretty much dead. So it's not very useful for most characters, to be honest. It's... It's hit or miss whether this thing will even activate. But we are a Rune Master, so we get Sacred Rage. Provides a little bit of synergy, to be honest. We have 20% damage absorption below 40%, and we will fear things away. So the likelihood that this will go off is much higher with this combination than other combinations. So just keep that in mind. I did have it trigger a few times in my playthrough. Again, this character did not die at all. So those two times, it actually saved my life. So that was good. It's got a three-second duration. The duration is for the damage absorb. That's 94%. That's enough time for this character to start leeching again. That's enough time for uh, your potion to maybe come off cooldown. And by the way, the things that will kill you on this build is when you're approaching a group of enemies and you haven't attacked yet and they engage on you first, your health is going to chunk down to nothing. But once you hit at least one enemy, your leech is just going to its going to shoot straight up. It's going to be pretty amazing. Of course, that's more of an endgame thing, but that's the idea. And the other thing it does then is that it heals 990 health restored. That's not a bad heal. It's good enough to keep you above that threshold, right? That 15%, that's a bad place to be. So an instant heal, that's decent. Just keep in mind that Death Ward at one point is awful. It's abysmally bad. This is another skill that you need to max out. You need to get 8 of 8 as soon as possible, just like uh, Frightening Power. And by the way, those are both your big defensive cooldowns. So you're going to want to get these early. Do not wait too long to get Death Ward. Do not wait too long to get Frightening Power. Outsider, of course, you'll leave him at one point for most of the game. I decided to max him for Legendary because I love this thing. I don't have any minus recharge to support him unless I have the Presence of Mind to Circle of Power first, which I don't. Uh, so I just used him for big bosses. 
and he turned out just fine. In fact, him and my behemoth scroll, they were my best pals the whole playthrough. He's your boss killer, he's a big cooldown, most of the time he'll die in normal mode, but once you put a few more points into him, you'll see him just chunk things down. If you're ever in a bind, there's a lot of Mac-A archers around, just summon this guy and he'll just go around the screen like teleporting, just hitting him with his stick and he'll just kill everything. He's great. He'll die, he always seems to die right when he's done his job. It's like, you know, you salute him, he's he's going down, but he's killed like all the Mac-A archers. It's like Terminator, it's like the end of Terminator, he's got his thumb up going down in the lava. He's got your back, so I like him. I would recommend maxing him out eventually, but for the most part, for most of the game, just one point will do. I never made Dark Covenant work with this build. I didn't want too many buttons to press, frankly. The total speed would have been nice, but I don't like the malices here. And the scaling to the damage, the only one I can make use of is Elemental and Vitality. And I just didn't want to. That's all there is to it. I didn't really have, again, the recharge to support this cooldown. Uh, by the way, recharge would be pretty good for this build, but not necessary. So, no Dark Covenant for me. I did try to test Visions of Death. I find it annoying to use if you're not one of those people. By all means, it's another great tool. It's like Squall, except if Squall was really annoying to play with. And here's the Heartbreaker, Life Drain. This was supposed to be part of the build. It fits the theme. Life Drain with Cascade. I was a little bit unsure about this one. And sure enough, it doesn't really fit this build. It's just not powerful enough at any point in the game to be worthwhile. Yes, it can heal you for a lot of damage, but that's pretty inconsistent. If you hit an enemy and it doesn't cascade, well, you're in trouble. Also, I felt that just using this cast was frankly worse than auto-attacking one other enemy in terms of leech, and it just doesn't fit. It's too much investment. So no on the life drain, I would say. Spirit Ward. I wouldn't say you need Spirit Ward. I'd definitely put one point into it. But don't max it out until Epic Mode Undead Typhon. He's at the start of Hades Palace, I think. Yeah, that's right. You're going to need it for that fight, probably. So that's the benchmark I would use to max out Spirit Ward before that. Just get one point. Use it for Undead. It's fine. Spirit Bane is a luxury. Definitely not needed. I ended up mm, getting close to maxing it out, but it's not that important. You know, put one point into it in the early game. It's fine. And Circle of Power is a big cooldown. This thing is a pretty amazing cooldown. It's not, it doesn't give you a reticle, it just kind of appears next to you. I wish the range were slightly bigger, but if you can set up on the boss, this is the burst, by the way, if you can set up on the boss to seal a fate while you have rune word charges up, then you just use everything. I'll wait for this cooldown to come up. Can I speed it up? All right, so you're walking around, you've got your rune weapon up, you seal a fate, that goes off, you do this immediately, shotgun. And you're attacking some more and you shotgun again. So you can get two shotguns within this uh, within this circle of power. And the reason he's good is because he gives you 100% life leech, which is a lot, and 100% vitality, which, again, is a lot. Those are the only things we really care about on here. But remember, we're using Fury's Heartblood. We're ideally using that uh, suffix on our weapon that gives... 60 more vitality plus some stun. Unfortunately, I don't have that on this weapon. I had to make do with the best of what I can find. Uh, obviously, the voracious prefix is the more important thing. This is all I could do, so... You're going to have a lot of vitality damage regardless, and that's just going to add to it. So you're going to find that your burst is immeasurably higher if you have Circle of Power up. And the last thing to talk about then is the Lich. I tried the Lich on a number of occasions, the problem with the Lich is, is he attracts enemies to him, and because of that, you can't herd people into your Rune of Power. That's a big part of this build. It's a huge part of how this build plays. You really want to make sure that you're running away from minions or whatever. You've got a Circle Power trap waiting for them, and they get into it right when you're ready to shotgun them, Leech from them, and then just kill them. That's a huge, huge part of the playstyle of this character. And the Lich just takes away more than it provides. It, you don't have room with your gearing in order to get some of the Allfather's gear, or the other pet scaling gear, to make him really powerful. So he's just going to be this mediocre body bag that, frankly, ruins your positioning. So I don't think Lich is a good tool for this build at all. I don't think he fits at all. 
and I don't think you should make him fit. You should be happy that you don't have to deal with the enormous investment that is the Lich King. But otherwise, he would be a staple of any spirit build. I love the Lich King, just not in this one. So let's go over my gear real quick and what to look for. So if I were to open my inventory, first the weapon, I've shown this off many times already. Uh, you're going to be dual wielding these, so you're going to have to find two hearts bloods in epic mode. In normal mode, you're going to have a shield. In legendary, you're going to have a shield. You absolutely want both the life leech prefix and you want the charm bonus completion on your Fury's Heart Blood. So this thing is providing me over 300 life leech over three seconds. Remember, I can apply that onto up to five targets plus whoever else I auto attack within those three seconds. So let's just say it's five. That's 1500 base life leeched over three seconds that I'm getting in health. You add to that necrosis. Uh, where is it? Here. You add to that circle of power. And by the way, every character gains 2.5% energy leech and life leech per level. So for a level 70 character, that's, oh boy, math. 25 times, 25 times 5 is 125 plus 50, 175. Did I do that right? I, who cares, right? It's a lot. So that's a lot of scaling. And you're going to get Circle of Power on top of that. That 1500 is going to scale into, who knows, uh, 5,000, 6,000 per second. That's the type of... You, you look at a regen build, right? And I talked about this on the defense guide. In order to get regen to even work, to even get you in the hundreds, you have to have enormous opportunity cost. Of course, life regen always works. It's always active. It's independent of leech. It doesn't care about undead. But that it, the, the magnitude is just too small. You take that and compare it to something like this Life Leech character where I can leech thousands, many thousands per second of health without too much setup, to be honest. Uh, and the proof is in the videos. If you watched the intro video like while I was talking before, you'll see that this thing leeches like an absolute monster. And because of that leech and death chill aura, I was able to survive. So that's how it works. You want that weapon. My shield, this is the reason you need to switch back to shields. You can get a carapace that gives you 81% pierce resistance. That's a lot of pierce resistance. Uh, I said before, this character is a farming character. I had to farm this carapace exactly to be like this. I had to farm this yeti fur on my boots to be exactly like this. You don't always need a yeti fur. It's dependent on what gear you happen to have. But for my stats in legendary, and this is not legendary, by the way, let me go into Legendary so you can see what my stats are legitimately. I was farming the Primrose. So if I have my buff up, I have pretty much all resists maxed except for Lightning. It's at 68. Poison's at 73. And Bleed is at negative 55. But I also have 17 Fizz Res. And I have some Bleed swap gear in case I ever need it. It's not really that useful. So I really needed the extra pierce res. If I don't have this, you can see I'm 60 behind. If I don't have the Yeti fur, I'm 16 instead of 80. So all of those things are extremely useful, and I need them for my build. Of course, these boots, I just got them from the Ichthians in Act 5. They had health and a lot of resists, so I kept them. They're not, they're not best in slot or anything like that. Uh, this Band of Souls, though, this thing is very, very good. So normally I would look at this item... And you know what I would do? I would stop looking at it because it sucks. But for this character, there's one particular thing that he really, really needs, and it's not the life leech. So the 30% chance of applying 123 to 141 life leech, and that's retaliation, which is pretty good. That's good, right? But what I really want out of it is the energy leech resistance. You are going to need energy leech resistance somewhere on your gear, and that is an absolute... 100% requirement. That's not something you're going to say for a lot of characters. But remember, with Death Chill Aura, you live or die uh, by this buff. You really need Ravages of Time. If you don't trust me, put on Death Chill Aura, go out and attack some mobs, turn off Death Chill Aura, and see how fast you die. It's an amazing night and day difference. You really need Death Chill Aura. So in order to keep your energy from getting stripped, random weapons that enemies carry can have energy leech on them. It can just, it can be a nightmare. It happened very frequently. 
just get energy leech resistance somewhere on your gear. This takes care of all of my needs forever. Even if I get my resistance reduced, I've overcapped it, so great. This ring also gives me a bunch of other stuff. Uh, the most notable thing is probably the percent life leech down there. That used to be higher, but because the Ragnarok legendary reforging system is such a joy, I lost about half of it when I reforged this item. So I gained, I think, the armor and the pierce resistance, and I lost about half of my life leech. Um, what are you going to do? I don't know what I would rather have. I think the pierce res was just a little bit more important than having the extra life leech, but this band of souls could be way better than it is. Just keep that in mind. For my helmet, unfortunately, I was not able to become disattached to this helmet as Sathenos Wisdom. I recommend that this build uses Sathenos Wisdom. You're going to need some casting speed, so that way you never whiff your uh, Seal of Fate. By that I mean there's a small cast time with every spell, and you don't want that to influence whether or not you can use a clutch ability like Men Here Wall or Seal of Fate. It's the difference between life and death sometimes. The reason I wasn't able to get rid of this is because this is where my reduction to all requirements comes into play. I said before everyone needs some for this build. This is the only place I could find it, and I could get a Toth's Glory or something that would work, but I kind of needed the Pierce Resist on this thing. A Toth's Glory would have been better for this build. It happened to roll Lightning Res too. Anyway, the Fizz Res is good. This is the epic version of Sathenos. You farm this in the Labyrinth at the same spot as the Stonebinder's Cuffs. I don't believe it's the same mobs. I think it's actually the Sentinels and the White Mobs that drop Sathenos. I could be wrong on that. But what's native to this item is the Fizz Res, the cast speed, and I believe maybe the energy. So you could get a lot of good stuff on this thing. I could have gotten a slightly better one, but I was kind of stuck to this one. I did try to farm for better, but couldn't really find it. Ring is pretty standard. You'll know I like this sort of thing. I had to farm Demon's Blood for the Fire Resist completion bonus. That's just to make sure my resists are good. Uh, and then, of course, Stonebinder's Cuffs, this time legendary. They're pretty good. 42% poison res. I'm happy with that. That's a prefix without a suffix, but at the end of the day, I'll take a poison res prefix any day of the week. Uh, of course, it could roll health on top of that, so whatever the prefix is, Stonebinder Cuffs of Immortality, that would be really good. But I didn't get that. These are good enough for me. The Primal Magma, again, I rolled a completion bonus for Fire Res. That's by design. I need that Fire Res. So you're very particular in your farming. Everything is very tight on this character. I was very lucky to come out of this with 7,000 health. Almost full resists. Again, let me apply my buff. And my DA as high as I have it. My DA is completely held up by Corslet of Freya, by, by the way. This is a very overpowered item. So without it, I would have 500 DA. Literally cut in half. Even worse, actually. Uh, so what else do I have? Well, I guess we can go over the corslet. This was, I think, enchanted. The recharge is part of the item. This plus skills is part of the item. I think I rolled the elemental damage and the life leech retaliation. The life leech retaliation is no big deal. But 111% DA, that's just... That's stupidly overpowered, and that was a Ragnarok item. So it's almost like they took the philosophy from Anniversary Edition and they completely reversed it. They're just like, well, percent DA is too strong in the late game. That's That was the philosophy in Anniversary Edition. And then Ragnarok comes around, they're like, you know what item we need? Something with a lot of percent DA in the late game. This is just a ridiculous item. So, of course, you want Corsola de Freya and as many builds as you can get it. I happened to get a pretty good one, and it rolled decently, I guess. The Life Leech Retaliation happens to be useful for this build, but not very. And then, of course, my Dark Core. I'm only using this because I really need the Intellect. You can see if I can't use that, I can't use my Corselet. That's how it works. And I also wanted the Resists. I got 30 Pierce and 40 Lightning. Don't care about anything else, really. So, of course, you could do better here. So where I want to take this character, well, I mentioned at the beginning of the video that I really want a Life Leech Ring. This uh, Voracious Prefix, that can't just roll on weapons. It can also roll on amulets, and it can also roll on rings. So just like on the Dragon Hunter in that build guide video, where I was trying to buy my way into Aider, so being able to equip Aider on my rings instead of a Dionysus Wineskin, 
on this character, I'm trying to buy my way into getting a voracious ring of immortality. I don't have an example of that. It wouldn't be too hard to find. Those are both yellow affixes. So you can find a yellow ring that is a voracious ring of immortality. It doesn't have to be green. It's not like hail or prismatic or one of those. And I'm actually pretty close to being able to get it. I don't really rely on all this poison resist. I could probably get a better pristine plumage on my helmet. This is, a, I believe, an epic one. Uh, and I can tell because it says epic. I'm pretty smart. And there's also a legendary version. I can get the legendary version to roll extra poison resistance. And if I did that, I wouldn't need the poison res on my shield. So I can take a, a new shield and get lightning res on it with just as much health. That would take some vendor shopping. And if I got the lightning res, then I wouldn't need my lightning res swap ring. So all of a sudden, if I got that new pristine plumage and I vendor farm for the shield, I could buy my way into even more life leech. So that's 145 or potentially 168 more flat life leech that's applied on every single attack or, you know, to potentially five targets with my Thunderstrike. So that's enormously powerful. And that's sort of the direction I would take this character. I could get better boots. I could try to buy my way into a Toth's Glory, trying to find Lightning Res somewhere else, maybe again in the boots. Yeah, it's stuff like that. This character is by no means complete. But he's got all the pieces that I'd normally have, and they're all pretty good. This is a nullifying amulet of immortality, a very good one, too. So I was lucky to find this. And of course, I got my swap gear. Every character with Ragnarok, uh, so hopefully you're listening to this tip because I don't think I've talked about it before. You need bleed res as a swap. So for me, I have this chest piece. It's got a legendary boar's hide. Total of, let's see, 65 plus 23, that's 88 bleed res. So if I put this on, I've got 33 bleed res. That's good enough to handle the golden boar. It's good enough to handle trolls at the start of Act 5. It's good enough to handle Yao Guai. So that's what you need it for. Uh, there's also, what's his name, Boar Snatcher. That does bleed damage. Aside from those encounters, you just don't need bleed res. But I could get it if I needed it. And the reason I bring this up is because I think the prefixes, the impenetrable, the rigid, all those... They're supposed to have an equal part of providing either pierce or bleeding resist when you find them. So if I found, uh, what's a good example? I don't have any examples, unfortunately. But if you go to the vendor and you find like a rigid helm, that will be like 8% pierce res or something like that. Well, you should also be able to find a rigid helm that provides bleed res, according to the database, but you can't. I don't think you can anyway. If you can, it's astronomically rare. I think it's bugged, but either way, it's very hard to find bleed res, so I really, really recommend that you pick up and save anything. And I mean anything that can give you bleed resistance. And you keep it until you find a better one. Treat it like Glade gear. Treat it like a ritual necklace. Do I have a ritual necklace? No, I don't. I gave it to another character. Treat it like all those other things you would keep, and keep the best version of your bleed gear. I got this helmet. I've got this chest piece. And the other swap gear, by the way, is just other elements in case I needed them. A prismatic in case, well, I don't need that. I have the nullifying. It's just straight up better. So most of these are artifacts from before. I just never got rid of them. And the glade gear, you keep that for Cerberus. So how about how this thing plays then? Well, playing this character is a little bit more complicated than the Dragon Hunter, which isn't saying much, to be honest. Uh, but you're going to want to keep your buffs up, of course. Death Chill Aura is really important. And first I want to talk about this whole auto hotkey thing. Again, it's the thing that allows me to hit a button on my action bar that would normally create a reticle, so then you'd have to click again and it's super annoying. Instead, I just click the button and it goes off. Well, that's because I'm using a script that after I press 4, the script will then immediately click. It'll immediately cast a, uh, a left click. So you can do that with Auto Hotkey. That's a third-party program. I don't work for Auto Hotkey. I'm just trying to be helpful here. If you're worried about it being bloatware, trust me, it's not. It's uh, well, I mean, it runs alongside your game. It's an executable. Every script is saved as an executable. Uh, but the program itself is very lightweight. If you look in your processes, it barely makes a dent. It doesn't open like three or four processes. Just the one. Just the executable for the script you wrote. You don't have to write the script. They, they're, I think the guy I found it on was on the Steam forums for Titan Quest. His name was Mevo. 
So if you Google those things, you'll find the particular script. You can mess with it a little bit. A uh, person in my chat also mentioned using a macro for your keyboard. If you use Logitech keyboards, you can program your keys with certain macros. The macros are super easy to make. I, I downloaded the software myself and just tested it out. It's absurdly easy. You just go to the multi hot key functionality. You'll click on the box that says press two keys. You'll click on say four and then left click. I think you might have to like right click and you say insert mouse click or something like that. It's really easy. You'll be able to figure it out. If you play video games, you'll be able to figure it out. So there's two ways to do it. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have built in functionality to make this easier for hot bar spells. Just so you know, this character very much relies on either having auto hotkey or a mouse script, unless you really want to deal with having to click and then click again. Uh, so just keep that in mind if you're thinking of making this build. So if we're going to go and attack some things, then we'll put our debuff up just in case. And the, the whole thing you do here is you just try to auto attack as many things as possible. So you can see these are undead here. I can't really leech from undead, so they're going to be the bane of your existence. But luckily you have spirit wards, so these are legendary creatures. They're not too bad. And I can survive with them. And of course I would seal fate eventually, but just to show undead can't really kill you. You can't really kill them either. I mean, you, you can with seal of fate. But for the most part, you can choose to run by them, which is still what I recommend. Most builds, I recommend doing that. But they're not going to kill you either. What your bread and butter is, is everything else, which is most of the game, frankly. Now, these guys do a lot of damage. This is legendary difficulty. And if you're looking at my health bar, and you're looking at these damage numbers above my head, it seems off. I should be taking a lot more damage than, than I am. Well, that's because the life leech I have is so incredibly potent that most of the time it looks like this. I look completely immortal. I look like I have a, a life, some sort of god cheat or something like that. There's nothing like that. That's just the insane amount of life leech. If I can get myself damaged, and these guys are taking life leech retaliation, so that's not very helpful. Uh, well, I wanted to test it, but this character can't even die. He's too horrible to die. I, I mean, I can't even take damage. I haven't even applied the leech on my weapon yet. So I was hoping to take maybe 40% of my life or so. So there we go. If I leech, automatically goes back up. So you just attack targets and you leech. So you don't have to use potions, except for in emergency situations. You just attack things. And this isn't even really the whole th your whole arsenal, of course. You have, you know, men here wall to buy you some time. If you're farming a, a bunch of dudes together in order to kill them, then you can eventually seal fate. So if I go back here towards the Formicid area, I can demonstrate that. So you're here, you cast seal fate in front of you, expecting them to run into you, and you sort of bait them into the circle. Again, there's a bit of a wind-up time on seal of fate, so you have to play it that way. You have to make sure that you don't cast seal fate ahead of you, except on casters like that. Uh, for the most part, you're running away or you're repositioning or you're waiting for the cooldown on Seal of Fate. And you're just looking for an opportunity to bait people into it. So over here might be a good place. So you can see I cast it and I ran them into the Seal of Fate. I've had a lot of practice doing that. That's because I've played this character a lot. So if you play this character enough or if you play with Seal of Fate enough, you'll be able to do that too. And it kind of just plays like that. So if we find a boss then, which we have k -Ron over here. Kron will be a good target because I can't leech from Kron, so we'll see how we do. Of course, he's an undead, so is he undead? Yeah, he's undead, so this is going to be the fight of the immortals. So we're going to get him into phase two, and then you can see, even with his high resist, he's just dying. Maybe this is not a good example, uh, but if I do this, I can cast this and then shotgun him, and then he's pretty much dead. I can shotgun him one more time. So that was the combo I went over earlier. You you have your rune weapon up, you seal a fate. Right when seal fate's about to explode is when you cast Circle of Power. Then you shotgun immediately, that's one shotgun. And then after your shotgun's back off cooldown, you shotgun again. And if you wanted to, if this guy wasn't such a pushover, you can cast your outsider and he would just dominate the fight. So I think we'll try to get ourselves into a little bit of trouble. I'll show off that item just in case you want to see it. It's a life leech item, look at that. It's pretty bad though. So I'll try to get into a little bit of trouble and see if our outsider can rescue us. 
we might have to get into some pretend trouble because nothing here can really give us actual trouble. And again, this is legendary. These mobs are supposed to be very, very painful. Uh, but let's say these crabs were giving me grief. I could summon my outsider. I can throw up a men here as well. I can buy myself a lot of time to get some leech up. I can help out with some seal of fates. I mean, you have a lot of tools when things get, you know, really bad. If you've ever been in the Tower of Judgment and Mac A archers are on you, you run all those Mac A archers into another group with some grandmasters and you say, oh crap, I'm about to die. You have so many tools. You can start leeching immediately, that's what I would recommend, and then immediately run away. Cast a men here as well, cast your outsider, maybe try to put up a seal of fate next to your men here as well, knowing that they're all going to attack it. So a lot of them will get hit, and then you just keep leeching. You apply your life leech to as many separate targets as you can. Don't just tunnel into one target. And you try to get your Thunderstrike to hit as many targets as possible too, and that's just going to way amplify your leech. So I had more gameplay at the start of this video, so now that you know how the character works, you can take a look at that stuff and, and just see how crazy it is. But it's a lot of stutter step until you're ready to farm them into a place, and then you just kill them. So this character will never reach the pinnacle of damage, but you can see this damage is pretty insane. To me, it's insane. This character I was very pleased with. But it's not going to kill bosses in two seconds. So that's the only sort of thing you have to contend with. So my last impression on this character is that it's not a starter character. This is not a beginner-friendly character, both in concept or in execution. It's definitely the most advanced character I think I've played in this game. Compared to other ARPGs, it's not so hard. Most of the difficulty comes in building it, specifically with the attributes. So if you're experienced and you know how to deal with attributes going through the game, you know, take a shot. If you're not experienced, but you still want to play this character because it seems strong or cool, then what I recommend with the attributes is that you save like 8 to 12 attribute points as you level. And just when you're at the vendor, take a look at some of the intellect gear. If you see that you're starting to become behind, maybe put a few points into intelligence. You know, if you don't have a lot of health, like 1,500 or 2,000 by Babylon, put a couple more into health. You don't necessarily need to meet those benchmarks. I think I was right at 1,500 at Babylon, which is the low end of my personal benchmarking. I like to have 1,500 by normal Babylon, about 3,000 by the end of normal, 5,000 by the middle of epic, and 7,000 by the middle of legendary. That's what I like. So however your benchmarks work, you know, go for that. Just keep some attributes just in case you screw things up. Again, you can't respec your attributes out, so that's pretty harsh. Anyway, if you could believe it, I've got even more overpowered characters in the pipeline. The next video for build guides is going to be the Conqueror. Uh, but after that, I have an Evoker coming out who's just ridiculous. If you want to ask me any questions or just hang out, you're more than welcome to come by my Twitch the description and the link will be in the base of this video. Uh, I would appreciate if you stop by and chat and stuff like that, and I love to talk about Titan Quest and builds in general. But otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.